Hello and welcome to chapter 17 on electrochemistry. So electrochemistry, uh, as the name kind of implies, is when we're dealing with chemical reactions that involve electrical current. Um, and what we mean is the flow of electrons. Um, so electrons are going to be transferred from one substance, atom, ion, compound, uh, to another. Okay, so we're going to be moving electrons around. Uh, and so for spontaneous reactions, the reason why this is useful is if that flow of electrons can be harnessed, we can use it to do things like light up, batter, light, up light bulbs. And so one of the biggest things, we have this picture of this kind of reaction set up over here. Um, this is called a cell. We'll get there by the end of today. Um, but this is the basis for batteries, where we have a chemical reaction that is contained within this sort of enclosed uh, system and there is you are driving power uh, which is the flow of electrons from a chemical reaction and because the chemical reaction is spontaneous it's just happening and the electrons are just flowing and you can use that to light up things power your phone uh, drive a car uh, any sort of stuff like that so all of this chemistry this electrochemistry is driven by oxidation reduction reactions which are also called redox reactions so there are reactions that are, you know, in a battery um, like this, but there's also plenty of other cases where redox reactions come up. Uh, bleach uses redox chemistry, fire is redox, rust. Um, there's usually a lot of energy involved in these reactions that we can either harness or just use that heavy duty spontaneity to our advantage. Um, so a lot of times they're used for practical purposes. There is also corrosion, which is a degrading reaction, um, but there's a lot of practical um, redox reactions as well. And so um, the technical definitions of these reactions uh, is that they involve the transfer of electrons. We break them up into two uh, different ideas, oxidation and reduction. Um, oxidation is the process of losing electrons and reduction is the process of gaining electrons. So whenever we have a transfer of electrons, something has to undergo oxidation because something has to lose electrons. And then you see, you can think something spits out the electrons and then the electron transfers into whatever gets reduced. Um, so one of the things to note about this world of redox chemistry is some of this language is pretty confusing because reduction uh, means generally not gaining. Um, so, but it is reduction is gaining electrons because it's the reduction is actually talking about the charge because electrons are negative. Um, so we do want to learn this sort of idea that oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. Oil rig um, is the common one I uh, have used, uh, you know, living in Texas, uh, you know, why we use that. But Leo Gurr, uh, loss of electrons is oxidation, gain electrons is reduction. You may have learned one previously. I would recommend using those mnemonics. There's a lot of confusing language in redox chemistry. And the more ways you have to keep them together, keep everything kind of organized is going to be uh, helpful. Um, but one of the important things is even though these are two separate processes, they always have to occur simultaneously. You don't just have things losing electrons and oxidation without something else taking that electron or gaining it in reduction. So when we look at reactions, sometimes we can see it's more clear than others that tr electrons are being transferred, especially when we have reactions where things become ions, right? If we look in this top reaction, zinc in the reactants is neutral and in the products it is now a cation so it had to have lost electrons and it's opposite copper went from being a cation to being neutral it had to gain electrons similarly in the second reaction we have sodium reacting with chloride chlorine to make sodium chloride it's not a net ionic reaction where we're explicitly showing that but we do know that we have formed an ionic compound so that's an ionic compound. We started with not ions, meaning we had to have some transfer of electrons. There are a lot of other redox reactions that are a bit more opaque that electrons are moving around or are transferring. Um, and they generally involve things that are not ions. So we can have redox reactions where there are still covalent species and just the distribution of electrons is changing. A lot of it has to do with changes in polarity, uh, changing what's the positive end, what's the negative end. Um, and so it's harder to parse out what's going on in these. But um, uh, one of the things that we can see is that uh, where there are some signifiers, one of them being that combustion reactions are always redox. Um, so if we have a combustion reaction, that's always redox. Um, if you look at the second one, H2O2, there's only even one reactant. That is still a redox reaction. It's going to be a lot harder to parse out unless 
um, we have a way to kind of keep tabs on all of this stuff. And that's where the idea of oxidation numbers comes in. Oxidation numbers are values that describe the distributions of electrons in a molecule. Technically, or like, you know, functionally when you're using them, you're imagining that all bonds are ionic. Obviously in a covalent compound, that's not real. You aren't trying to generate real charges. You're trying to kind of think about what are the electrons are kind of spending their average time. What is the distribution of electrons in a molecule? And so you're kind of making up some fake similar to charges. And so because their charges or charge like changes in these oxidation numbers are gonna be indicative of a redox uh, reaction, right? Because there's move of charge, things are changing their charge. Reduction is decrease in oxidation number. That's literally where the, uh, the word reduction comes from. You are decreasing the oxidation number, decreasing the charge, effective charge. Oxidation is increasing oxidation number. So as the name implies, oxidation number, if you oxidize something, it gets more oxidized. So the increase, the oxidation number goes up. To come up with oxidation numbers, we have, um, basically it's just gonna be a set of rules. And so we always wanna use this set of rules. It's gonna be an algorithm where atoms in their elemental state have oxidation number zero, monatomic ions have an oxidation state equal to charge of the ion. Basically, if you have say sodium plus, you don't need to imagine where it's charges it just, you know, it's not like you're imagining it's ionic, it just is ionic. So the oxidation number just equals the charge of plus one. If you do have a covalent compound, um, you can then assign charges based on order of preference, fluorine being the highest because it's the most electronegative, hydrogen being the next highest because it can only ever form one bond, oxygen because it's electronegative, other halogens. So those sort of tendencies, um, it's the charges that you tend to see when they form compounds or when they form ionic compounds. And then there's another rule that the sum of the oxidation numbers in the compound must equal the total charge of that compound. So generally we try to figure out um, the oxidation number for a couple different types of atoms. And then we use this bottom one here um, to kind of figure out the other atoms that aren't on here, things that aren't ions or say carbon, because it's based on the idea that the sum of the oxidation numbers must equal the total charge on that object. If it's an ion, whatever the charge of that. If it's, in, if it's a molecule, it has to, they have to sum up to be zero because it has to be neutral. So let's look at some examples. Determining oxidation number for each, each atom type. And again, for any particular molecule, each atom type is gonna have an oxidation number. Um, so F2, if I wanna start with that, fluorine. Um, this is one that does trip people up quite a bit because fluorine is a special case, but this is elemental. F2, this is fluorine, this, comp this, this molecule is just fluorine atoms. Um, that's an elemental species. So fluorine in this case is zero. Only in molecules does fluorine get assigned that negative one charge. Um, next thing we have is CO2. Um, so I wanna look, carbon and oxygen each need them. Um, it's not elemental, it's not ionic. So then I come down to my preferences. Well, oxygen is gonna be given a negative two. Oxygen always wants to be negative two. So now the question becomes, what is carbon? And this is where I use the fact that the sum must be the total charge, where this is a neutral molecule, carbon dioxide. So the sum of all of the oxidation numbers must be zero. So if I think about that mathematically, basically what I'm saying is the carbon charge plus two times negative two, that oxygen charge must be zero. So basically each oxygen atom is negative two. And then I have two of those oxygen atoms. So then that'd be negative four. Overall, my carbon must have a charge of positive four. So the oxidation number of oxygen is negative two and carbon is positive four. If I now look at sodium carbonate, this is an ionic species. So I can say right off the bat, sodium is a monoatomic ion, right? This is Na plus and CO3 two minus. This N sodium is then going to have an oxidation number of plus one because the ion has a charge of plus one, we'll just use that. So now I need to look at carbon and oxygen. That's a polyatomic ion, so I can't assign the charge from the overall ion to that. Instead, I need to use my the rules I've used previously that the oxygen is going to be negative two in this case. It has a higher preference than the carbon. So then when I'm looking to do the sum, now I'm looking for the sum of this carbonate ion. I have carbon and oxygen in there, and together the charge is negative two. So when I look at the carbon and oxygens together, that sum needs to be negative two. So this negative two matches this charge. This three oxygens comes from right here. And then I can see that I also then have a carbon from right there. 
And so negative six plus what equals negative two? The carbon is plus four in this carbonate ion that we have right here. And actually carbon is plus four in all carbonate ions, right? That didn't depend on the sodium, that just was from the carbonate. If we now look at P4O10, oxygen must be negative two here. Phosphorus doesn't have a preference. Total sum must be zero. So phosphorus times four, plus 10 times the negative two has to be equal to zero, which means the phosphorus is positive five, right? Four times positive five is positive 20. 10 times negative two is negative 20. So we, you can have oxidation numbers, whatever you want them to be. Um, they just need to be balanced out. Your charge sum up to that total charge. So now that we know how to assign oxidation numbers, we want to apply them, right? We want to be able to, the whole point was we wanted to identify reduction oxidation reactions. So if I look at this case, this was something that I said, I would know, I could see things are changing cations, ion, uh, things are becoming ions or not becoming ions. Um, so I want to be able to look at it and know what is being oxidized and what is being reduced. And so the process there is always going to be, I'm always going to start out with by, you know, assigning oxidation numbers. And so in the case of this, I only have ions or neutral species. So my oxidation numbers are going to follow directly from the charge, right? Nickel two plus has an oxidation number of plus two. Chromium solid is elemental, so it has an oxidation number of zero. Then once I assign oxidation numbers to each atom type on each side of the reaction, now I can look at changes in oxidation numbers across the reaction. So nickel goes from plus two to zero. We can see it's plus two on the reactants, zero on the products, whereas chromium goes from zero to plus two as it goes across the reaction. So we can see there's this change in the oxidation number as I go across the reaction. I'm comparing reactants to products. Then if I look, I can see that nickel, that's a decrease. Positive two to zero is a decrease. Chromium, zero to positive two is an increase. A decrease in oxidation number is reduction and an increase in oxidation number is oxidation. You can see for reduction, there was a gain of electrons. Oxidation is a loss of electrons. Oil rig, Leo Gurr, we want to be remembering those things. Um, and so just like we assign oxidation numbers to each atom type, individual atom types are always going to be associated with reduction or oxidation. So whenever we're faced with figuring these things out, what's oxidized and what's reduced, we're always going to look to uh, compute oxidation numbers and then look at how they change across the reaction. So we can put this all together, get all, all of our lingo in the following reaction. What is oxidized and what is reduced? What is the reducing agent? What is the oxidizing agent? If we look, we can see this is a combustion reaction. So we do know off the bat that it is reduction oxidation. So there's going to be something that's oxidized and something that's reduced. Um, but it's not going to be very, it's not easy to identify what is what in here. So I have CH4, I have O2, CO2, and H2O. Um, and so the first step is always going to be assign some oxidation numbers. Get oxidation numbers for each atom type on both sides of the reaction. Um, so we can see, you know, O2 is elemental, it's zero. Um, and all of the species that hydrogen is in, hydrogen takes the plus one. And so the other species just takes whatever charge makes it neutral. And our carbon is a plus four and that's CO2 to balance it out. So um, we can compute all of our charges and see uh, all the oxidation numbers for every atom type in, on both sides of the reaction. So once we have all those, we want to look at changes in oxidation numbers. So if we look, carbon is negative four to positive four. That's an increase. Hydrogen goes plus one to plus one. That's no change. And oxygen goes zero to minus two. That's a decrease. So we can see that increase in oxidation number for carbon, that means it oxidized. Decrease in the oxidation number of oxygen means that it decreased. Okay, so that means the carbon atoms were oxidized and the oxygen atoms were reduced. Okay, so carbon's oxidized, oxygen is reduced. You'll see we assign that language to a particular atom type. The next question was the agent question. And so in that case, we want to then look at assigning particular compounds. So we can see that carbon was oxidized. So that means the molecule that carbon was in, in this case, the CH4, is the reducing agent because it made the other thing do reduction. O2 is then the oxidizing agent. Okay, so oxygen was reduced here, but the O2 molecule was the oxidizing agent. This right here is actually where all of this language comes from. 
O2 is a really good oxidizing agent. Oxidizing meaning react with oxygen. So one of the things, it's very confusing, I know. Reduction being gain uh, is, is on face confusing. But it all comes from the idea that oxygen is, we, people figured it out before they knew what was going on, that it was reactions with oxygen. So O2 is the oxidizing agent. So one of the ways you can always check yourself is, is O2, are you saying O2 is the oxidizing agent? Um, that's a place you always want to be. And, um, you know, and always reactants that contain those corresponding atoms when we're looking at agents. So that brings us to question one of participation assignment five. In the following reaction, what is oxidized and what is reduced? What is the reducing agent and what is the oxidizing agent? So I have 2K plus 2HF becomes 2KF plus H2. Again, this is question one on the assignment on Blackboard, participation five. In the following reaction, what is oxidized and what is reduced? What is the reducing agent and what is the oxidizing agent? That's gonna do it for this first video. Um, hopefully uh, redox, the idea of redox and oxidation numbers is something you've seen before. Uh, maybe a little bit rusty um, and that's okay. Um, we're, so that's the goal here is that we're all kind of on the same page as to what we need to know. Um, and hopefully some of these examples have been helpful um, to kind of get you back up to speed or kind of uh, uh, remembering, kind of dusting off some of the rust. Uh, if you have any questions about the stuff, we're gonna move through, we're not gonna really we're not gonna, we'll be using these kind of, some of these terms and stuff, uh, but you do have certainly time to review these ideas and review these materials. If you have any questions about any of this stuff, uh, please do let me know.